Buffy Quintero, I'm the Outreach Coordinator for International Programs. And before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to tell you about some of our upcoming International Mondays. Next Monday on February 19th, Dr. Ed Brands will give a talk about a microfinance project in India. On February 26th, Kathleen Staley, Staley uh, UI Counseling Services, who's here with us today, is going to give a talk about the Soviet American Peace Walk, Journey to My Roots, and it's about um, a personal experience that she had. And on March 5th, Monday, Alexis Bushnell from the UI Center for Human Rights will give a talk about her human rights internship in Cambodia. Um, following today's talk, we'll have a brief time for question and answer. If you'd like to ask a question, um, please uh, raise your hand and I'll come around with a microphone because this is being rebroadcast to be on the library channel, channel 10. So we'll make sure we get you caught on camera so you can appear on, on that channel. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Amy Mead, graduate student in the UI College of Education, and Professor Scott McNabb, also of the College of Education. Amy was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mongolia from 2003 to 2005. During her service, she taught English as a foreign language in a small town called Gurvan Bulag, and you might have to help me with that pronunciation. Um, she is currently working on a master's degree in social foundations of education at the College of Education. In addition, Amy is working as one of the two University of Iowa campus recruiters for the Peace Corps. So if you have more questions about uh, the Peace Corps, I'm sure she'll be able to answer questions in the Q&A or after the talk. Scott McNabb is a true friend of international programs. I was trying to remember how many of these International Mondays he's done, and I think maybe it's around three um, since the five years I've been here. He served as a Peace Corps volunteer from 1968 to 1971, teaching in the economics faculty of Tamasat University in Bangkok. The experience has been, had a profound effect on his personal and professional life. As a university professor, he has been able to return to Thailand to teach, conduct research, and consult on non-formal education and community college projects. He will travel again to Thailand in June, his 14th trip back since his initial Peace Corps introduction to the country. Their talk to today is entitled The Peace Corps Experience. Please help me in welcoming today's speakers. Thank you. Two of the most difficult questions that I've been asked since I returned from Peace Corps in July of 2005 are, why did you like Mongolia and what was the best part about Peace Corps? Well, I'm usually stumped when people ask me these questions, and for the past year and a half, I've been trying to come up with answers, and I always go back to about the same thing. Before I try to answer that question again today, I'll explain a little bit about Peace Corps and my role here on campus as a Peace Corps recruiter. Um, like Buffy said, I'm one of two campus reps, the other being Becky Bowman, who served in Turkmenistan during the same time that I served from 03 to 05. She also taught English as a foreign language in a small village. Um, Becky and I are recruiters in that we try to reach out to the 29,000 different students here at Iowa that are interested in Peace Corps. We try to help them along with applying and at this point in time, most people apply online. In addition, we provide assistance to those who have questions about their qualifications and help them to gain the experience they need to qualify for the positions that they're interested in doing while they're in Peace Corps. Becky and I are present at most job and career fairs on campus, as well as volunteer fairs. We organize monthly dinners with returned Peace Corps volunteers, as well as offer general informational meetings once a month. Each semester, we conduct application workshops and offer tips for completing the two essays. At the end of this month is National Peace Corps Week. It begins the 26th, which is a Monday, and we'll have a host of events throughout that week, including a general informational meeting, um, we'll be present at the Spring Job and Internship Fair. We'll have a Return Peace Corps volunteer dinner, but people who are interested are also welcome at the Community Thai Flavors. And Thursday, we'll have a send-off party here in this room for people who are about to leave for Peace Corps. Um, our office, by the way, is located on the, main flo uh, the second floor of the North Lindquist Center across from the main library. We hold weekly office hours and are available to meet one-on-one -on -one by appointment. Peace Corps has three main missions or goals. 
Since its inception, the Peace Corps has aimed to promote world peace and friendship through these three goals. The first goal is the one most people think of when they think of Peace Corps. It is helping the people of interested countries in meeting their need for trained men and women. Peace Corps does in fact stress this mission. In doing so, Peace Corps provides practical training in six major areas. Health and HIV AIDS, education and youth development, agriculture, environment, business development, and information technology. Within these six categories, there are over 26 different job assignments and opportunities. The second goal of Peace Corps is helping to promote a better understanding of Americans on the part of people served. And finally, the third goal, helping promote a better understanding of other people on the part of Americans. The second and third goal are underestimated, but are in fact the bread and butter of Peace Corps. If you only did the second and third goal, you'd have done over half of what you're supposed to do in Peace Corps. It's about friendship, cultural exchange, and broadening your horizons. Some of the most recent statistics in the world of Peace Corps. Currently, we have over 7,800 volunteers serving. At the moment, there are over 102 volunteers serving from Iowa, and we're close to reaching 2,000 who have ever served from Iowa. Peace Corps was officially established on March 1st, 1961, and to date we have sent over 187,000 volunteers to over 139 different countries. The most recent addition to Peace Corps is Cambodia. Their first group is scheduled to complete training in April this spring. There's no age limit to serve in the Peace Corps, but you must be at least 18 before you apply. Volunteers serve for 27 months, which includes three months of training. Training involves a host of activities, included, including learning the local language, acquiring the technical skills related to the job you've been assigned to, and the country's cultural traditions. So back to my first question, why, do, why did I enjoy Mongolia? Well, it's a combination of experiences. Some of them were funny, some sad, some hard, some exciting, all contributing to my general affinity for the culture and life that I experienced while I lived there. One story that comes to mind when asked this question involves some of my favorite people in Mongolia and reminds me of the spirit and character of the Mongolian people. I think this might help illustrate some of the cultural differences I experienced in the workplace and provide some insight into their value system. Imagine a vast open countryside, deserts and camels to the south, mountains and an endless horizon. Next, at a post office, a bank, a school, a government building, cultural center, seven small shops, a hospital, a population of about 800 Mongolians, and me. In spring of 2004, this was my, be, nearing the end of my first year teaching English at the secondary school. It was nearly graduation for the seniors and everyone was ready for some outdoor activity after the long winter months. I was unaware when I came to school that day that it wasn't just another Tuesday in my town. It was health day my students were telling me. And I thought to myself, health day? What, what is this going to entail? I found myself surrounded by excited students ready to leave the building in packs and head into the countryside. Sure enough, the entire school, K through 12, and all the teachers and faculty, including me, hiked south of our small town towards the desert and camels. I was excited. I often took hikes in this direction and I wondered what we would all be doing. At first, it was fairly familiar. The students divided up into their classes, along with their homeroom teacher, and it reminded me of the track and field days of my youth. The students began competing in a number of games, the younger ones playing variations of duck, duck, goose, and tag, while the older ones were playing more rigorous activities, climbing to the top of the mountain, tug of war, and long races. This lasted most of the day. I assumed that soon we would be heading back to the school to then, as we usually do, return to our respective residences and prepare dinner, calling it a day. I was wrong. Soon the teachers were laughing amongst themselves and joking around, talking about who was going to be on whose team and who was good at this and who was good at that. Before, my, before long, I found myself on one such team. The teachers who taught English, besides myself, and the Mongolian language and literature teachers. We were competing against another team which consisted of the history teacher, the math teacher, the science teacher, and our superintendent slash principal headmaster. The most exciting event to me and my fellow coworkers that day was the sumo wrestling competition. 
The art teacher, one of the younger male instructors at the school, drew a circle in the dirt and we began competing sumo style wrestling. Now, before going to Mongolia, being a kid from Iowa, I was well aware of wrestling. My brother had wrestled in high school and it was a common sport I was familiar with. But when I got to Mongolia, I was surprised to learn that wrestling is the national sport of the country. Not sumo style or freestyle like we have in the United States, but a specific Mongolian style wrestling. Mongolian wrestling is a very complex sport that can last for days and days and days on end, usually accompanied with a lot of ritual, horse racing, archery. Aside from that though, within the past 10 years, Mongolians have developed a strong affinity for sumo wrestling, and it's become a favorite cultural pastime. It's televised many evenings in season on Mongolian national television, which reaches every Mongolian in the country. It's, Mongolia itself has some heroes who have gone on to wrestle in Japan, and this has created a kind of cult following. You're probably imagining really big, naked Japanese men. <laughs> that wasn't exactly what it was like that day for me. Um, we had drawn a circle in the dirt, you know, this big or so. And what entailed was I was to step into the ring and face my superintendent. <laughs> and what I was supposed to do was to push her out of the ring. The first person to be pushed out of the ring would be the loser, and the one who didn't get pushed out would be the winner. So all so the time. <laughs> 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 We do participation and you get the feel from Mongolia. <laughs> and so we're standing around and all the teachers are just laughing and joking and thinking this is really hilarious, you know, Amy's going to be part of this. This is the best day, like we've had a really long time and it was, it was a definitely unusual day. Well, what I experienced and realized at this moment when I was standing in the ring facing the superintendent of my school, who was also a woman, um, my same age, at the time I was 24, was that I could never have this experience in America. When would I ever have the chance again to experience something so entirely different? When would I again find myself with my boss inside a ring about to test each other's strength and quickness? Uh, it's funny because I remember taking off my glasses and handing them to my fellow teammates. I almost started laughing, thinking, is she really going to push me? Am I, am I really going to do this? Well, I did. And if my memory serves me well, I believe I made it into the ring for three rounds. And in the end, I think she beat me two to one. It was unbelievable. I never thought that my experience in Peace Corps would lead to a cultural exchange such as this. And it is a memory that makes me smile every time I think of it. The next story I'm going to tell has to do with an experience that I had after I'd been home for almost six months. It was February last year, and I had decided to stop by the international fair that was being held at the University of Iowa Fieldhouse. I was looking forward to trying new foods and seeing what nationalities were being represented at the event. So when I arrived, I found a place in the bleachers to enjoy the music, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw an elderly man, kind of bent over, and he came walking along, dressed in complete Mongolian garb from head to toe. And he slowly walked over and sat down right in front of me. I could hardly believe this was happening, and I wasn't even sure if, I don't know, <laughs> this was real. So I placed my hand on his left shoulder, and he turned and looked at me, and I said in Mongolian, San Beno. I just thought, well, I better try it. See, you know, that's the only way to find out, which means, are you with wellness? And he looked at me, and he said, San, San, San Beno. Fine, fine, are you with wellness? And I said, yeah, fine. Yeah, San San, you know? <laughs> I, and I spit out, Mini near Amy. Um, my name is Amy. And he said, Mini near Puriv. My name is Puriv. And quickly I launched into why I could speak Mongolian and how I'd been living there two years as a Peace Corps volunteer. I worked in a small village west of the capital, 500 kilometers. I was trying to get everything out as quickly as I could, just keep him there for that moment and, and whatever I could get from that. And he replied, telling me that he was from the capital city, 
not originally, his family from, was actually from a western province, um, northwest province called Ulf Saimag originally. But he had moved to the capital a long time ago, raised a family. Actually, his two daughters live here in the States. One is in Minnesota, she's a dentist in Minneapolis, and one is in North Liberty. And now we've become good friends. But, so anyway, he explains some, a few things to me and says, I'll be right back. I'll, I'll bring my daughter over. So I wait, and I look back to see what he's doing, and he decided to grab a lunch and sit down amongst the crowd and <laughs> have, enjoy himself a meal. And so I thought, okay, uh, he said he'd be right back. And so at that moment I thought, wow, like, I might think this guy is rude had I not <coughs> been in Mongolia, and maybe I'm being presumptuous thinking I, thinking I understand his reality, but I kind of did understand his reality, and I knew that he would come back to me. This wasn't rudeness. He was taking his time, and he needed to eat lunch like anybody else, and so I laughed at myself thinking what I was thinking. And He returned with his um, daughter and her husband and their son. Her, her husband is American, and they have a child, so... Anyway, they came and sat over, and we became quick friends. Um, they invited me over for dinner the next night, um, which I did attend, and put have interviewed me for an article he wished to write when he returned to Mongolia. So we spoke for about five hours. And um, this was a really wonderful time for me. It was six months after I'd been home, and it was the first time I was able to have something like this happen. I mean, and it was really unexpected. Um, so what was the best part about Peace Corps? I'd say the ability to have an experience such as this and to develop a relationship with somebody and now an entire family of people who I otherwise would never have known. Because of the opportunities that Peace Corps provides, I was able to become fluent in a unique language and I was able to make a connection with somebody I otherwise never could have met that day. Thank you. Scott. Tough act to follow. I feel like uh, we had a Saturday Night Live <laughs> Skipped and sort of the cosmic Peace Corps moment rolled into, uh, into two stories. Uh, I was in Thailand a while ago, about 40 years ago, 68 to 71, and as I look at my career at the University of Iowa as a professor, I realize an awful lot of what I've done over the years has stemmed from that basic experience. Um, and I want to tell a story about a particular monk that I met uh, back, uh, actually not in my Peace Corps years, but I think the experience was made possible because of my Peace Corps experience uh, in a minute. But I just want to put in a couple of quick commercials, all right, for Amy and, uh, and Becky. Uh, one is that there are a lot of ways to get abroad, and I think we would agree that that's what we're talking about that's most important, is getting an opportunity to live somewhere else and work somewhere else. Peace Corps is one of many kinds of experiences that can offer that. It's got a good track record. I think their training is good. They emphasize language. There are a number of values that the Peace Corps has that I subscribe to. But there, Mary Grace, you were talking about Crossroads Africa, for example, the other day in my office. There are a lot of opportunities, uh, ways to get abroad. <laughs> but, uh, but the point I'm gonna emphasize is, is that the that length of time is, is important, that, that level of commitment. Second part of my commercial, if, if anything we say is intriguing and you're thinking about the possibility of of, uh, of joining the Peace Corps, don't miss it. Come and talk to one of these guys about the possibilities because this country is full of people who say they thought about it but they didn't quite close the deal. So yeah, I think you owe it to yourself to, to learn from Amy and Becky. If you're interested, come on over to the, uh, the Linquist Center. Um, the two-year idea. One of, one of the things that is often, I think, asked of recruiters is uh, particularly with younger people, people in their 20s, do I really want to spend two years? Isn't that a, a long time to spend? And, and my answer is yes and no. I mean, it is from your 20s, uh, it is a significant length of time. Now that I'm 60, it doesn't seem as, as long. Um, uh, but also, it really, I think, requires that commitment of time to get to know th another culture and another language and really begin to appreciate things from that, that other side. I think that people like Buffy and others that study international education know that you go through a series of kind of psychological adjustments when you're abroad. You know, kind of highs and lows of culture shock and so on. And it takes time to kind of work through those until you're really oriented to being in Thailand or Mongolia and looking at the world from that perspective out. And that I think is the, uh, is the great advantage 
There's an article I've used in my class, I think I used it in the class you were in, um, uh, written by a former Peace Corps volunteer, and it's called, What If George Bush Had Joined the Peace Corps? <laughs> and in a way it's tongue in cheek, but it really isn't. It really isn't, because I think uh, if you have an experience abroad for a significant period of time, I mean, I think, you know, Bush and I are the same age. I had a roommate from college that went and worked in Herat, Afghanistan for two years. If that had been George Bush, I think he would look at the world very differently. And he would see at least, I'm not talking conservative liberal, I'm just talking about complexity. You know, I think back, I visited my friend in Afghanistan just to, to meet his students and understand the variety of ethnicities and the role that religion played and the role of Iran next door and, and so on. Um, anyway, maybe we wouldn't be in the, uh, in the current shape we're in. Um, so the two years is a, is a significant amount of time, but I think the investment uh, pays off. Um, I've been very lucky in having that kind of that cosmic experience of the person coming and, and, and sitting down with Thai flavors here in town, just, just down the street here. I mean, what a, you know, it's like having a little bit of Thailand right, right here where I could go. And, and for me, Pak and Cherie were exemplars of Thailand and compassionate Buddhism and any number of things with their, with their work in the community. Um, so, the lessons, this is my last commercial and then I'll go to my monk. The lessons that you learn, I think, in another culture have a kind of a, a multiplier effect. I think when you're abroad and you learn things and you make adjustments and uh, you, you become more acquainted with another culture, you begin to reflect back on your own culture. So there's a kind of a comparative basis that makes the experience far richer. Um, and it's nothing wrong with living in Iowa and all the rest. I've been here since 1979. But I, I constantly kind of go back and forth to Thailand and I find that's a way to sort of, sort of enrich my life. And, and I also, since I've been in Thailand at various times in my life, from a single guy in the Peace Corps to married with Terry for a couple of years on dissertation research to back with my whole family uh, to do uh, uh, Fulbright back in 1991. It's sort of a way to gauge my life. Always on the airplane, I'm thinking sort of where am I? Where am I now? And, and you're right, my next trip will be, if you count my Peace Corps, my, my 15th trip. And in a way, that's not typical of Peace Corps volunteers, though there are a number of people in my group that have started their international careers based on their work back in the late 60s. One fellow in international uh, uh, ag uh, agriculture, another guy in banking uh, from my group, though some in my group have never gone back, uh, gone back to Thailand. Okay, um, I'm gonna pass around my, uh, this little uh, figure of a, of a monk. I'll give it to Buffy and, and so on. Um, and it's always a, a little bit tricky when you try to encapsulate a whole experience uh, of the Peace Corps or subsequent trips to Thailand in, in a story or two, but, um, but perhaps, perhaps this will be, be useful to you. Uh, by way of illustrating. If you notice, this is kind of an interesting monk. He's, uh, he's not sitting like a traditional monk. And secondly, he has a, a cheroot, you know, he's a smoker. And if you know anything about Buddhism in, in <coughs> Thailand and other countries, there are a whole, whole list of things that, uh, that monks are supposed to do, you know, rules and regulations. And this Luang Pa Kun is a, is a kind of rebel and an interesting character. And, and I, I'm, I'm well aware that there are those at the university that study Buddhism in a, in a highly disciplined way, and I'm a, I'm a rookie in the field of Buddhist studies. But I've always been intrigued in Thailand over the years that I've gone because there are socially active, engaged monks, there are socially conservative monks that are in the hierarchy in Bangkok. And then when you get up country, you find there are a number of these sort of populist monks, monks that have a particular reputation in an area and that people respect and, and go to and talk to, to get advice, to get a blessing, which I'm gonna be talking about, uh, and so on. So this, this particular man, who's quite elderly at this point, uh, uh, has a temple in Karat, near Karat, which is in Northeast Thailand. Um, he uh, has had a popular following, nationwide following, really for, for a long time, and I've, I was always intrigued with him, uh, and, and on one of my visits back in the mid-90s, I asked my friend at Burapa University, Sakta, a Thai friend I, 
again, over the years, you know, the advantage of having a long span is the relationship deepens. Uh, but I asked Sakta whether, well, maybe we could uh, visit this particular monk. And uh, on this one trip when I was working at Burapai University, we were able to go up to the Northeast and, uh, and to visit him. And um, it got me thinking about a, a, a number of things. One is, is the, the kind of elasticity and the tolerance within Thai culture to, to value different kinds of monks and, and the idea that people delight in this monk that's willing to break certain kind of rules. But he's also known as a monk who's extraordinarily constructive in terms of taking donations and providing them for hospitals and schools very directly. And I have a picture in my office of him handling money, which is, you know, monks aren't supposed to even touch money. But the idea is that it goes right from him to, to the various projects. And when you go visit his temple, the procedure is that uh, if, you, if you have a donation, you have a couple of different bills, and uh, he will take the one bill for his projects, and the other, I had like a 100 baht bill, which is like $3. He blessed it, and then you keep it for, for good luck. Uh, he also has, a, has a, a little habit, which is sort of interesting. He has a rolled up piece of paper, and you get a long line of people, and he sort of taps them on the head as he goes by in a kind of a blessing. I had it written in kind of bopping on the head, but that sounds not, not respectful. But just sort of a light, a light tap as he, went, as he went down the road. So we, uh, Sakta and I went to his, uh, to his temple this one afternoon, and, uh, and he was, uh, uh, gave a sermon, and then he was talking to the people who, who were there, and then went down the, uh, the, the row, taking the money and blessing the other bill and kind of tapping people on the forehead. And when he got to, to us, to my friend Sakta, uh, he engaged him in conversation and uh, told him a little bit about my background and my experience in Thailand and all the rest. And, uh, and the monk then talked to me a little bit and, and he joked with me. He asked whether I could eat kaunio, which is the sticky rice in the Northeast. Thailand, the Northeastern part of the country is really Lao speaking, much more like Laos than in Thailand in, in certain ways. And he was just delightful and I had this short conversation with him. Uh, but then instead of bopping me on the, uh, on the, on the head or tapping me, he, um, he blew on my forehead, and then he did it a second time. So it was unmistakable that you know, he was doing something of, of significance. And, and as I've talked to people since, I think it's a very simple kind of uh, giving me a sense of his essence or kind of, a, kind of a blessing. And it was just a very kind of a profound moment for me that he would be that, I don't know, that they, to give me that kind of blessing, to be that, uh, to that thoughtful in that, in that moment. And I, I realized that, uh, that that moment is kind of a metaphor for my experience in Thailand, that I, uh, that I have been blessed over the years with friendships and experiences there. And my life would be very different if I hadn't had the experience, which started back in the Peace Corps, and also started back by doing the homework of learning Thai and learning something about Thai culture, you know, paying our dues, which we did in Peace Corps training and which you do uh, as you're there. I mean, I don't think Mongolian is, is an easy language to learn, Thai is tonal. It takes a little while to, to get the hang of it. I mean, I remember during the, the down part of the culture shock, you know, the first you go through everything is wonderful here, and then you go through the, I'll never understand this place, uh, that I wondered whether I'd ever be able to be very fluent in Thai. But you know, it takes time, and the Thais are extraordinarily good, good, uh, good teachers. But you know, the Thais do this every day. When you go up country in Thailand, you see monks every morning going out with their bowls. And, and people put food in their bowls, and then the monk gives the people, uh, uh, the person who just gave them the food, a blessing. And I thought, what a, what a profoundly nice uh, part of society to take time in your everyday life to have that kind of exchange with the kind of spiritual part of your, of your population. Because of course, monks don't work in traditional ways, right? Their work is to go back and be monks and to meditate and do other kinds of things, uh, serve as counselors in, uh, in the community. Um, so that's, uh, that's, my, uh, that's my monk story. Um, I've been able to, as I say, be back on a number of occasions in, in different ways, consult on community colleges, and uh, I'll tell my second story. Uh, uh, there are certain lessons I, I learn every time I go back, and they have lessons to do with my own culture and uh, with Thai culture, and I, 
I realize I'm, I'm continually relearning things uh, during my trips. Um, my second story is that I was back in Thailand on a short Fulbright in January, exactly a year ago. I was teaching qualitative research at a, a university in the Kornpatom, which is about an hour outside of Bangkok. And um, we were, I, I taught some principles of qualitative research and then through my Thai colleagues we were working in a village and uh, each individual student had a project they were working on and so it was very hands-on and, and I think I think, uh, think worked out relatively well. Um, but at one point I was back at the university after being in the village a couple days and uh, I was anxious to get back so I could be consulting with the students, but the person that I was going to get the ride with back to the village had a meeting. Well, of course, it happens all the time. You know, happens here. But impatient American Scott was sort of like, come on, I want to get back to the, back to the village. And it wasn't going to happen, clearly. And then, as I was sitting there being American impatient, I realized that there was a ceremony going on at the university. It was graduation day. And, uh, and during the next couple hours I watched as you had up in front a row of monks who were chanting and if you were all the students, you were out here in, in the group and there was a ritual where each of the students went to some of the elderly professors at the university and there was a, you know, various symbolic things that they did in terms of sprinkling with water and they had a, a textbook and there were things that the professor said to the teachers to be about their responsibilities in Thai society. Then the teachers had things they said back to their professors about trying to live up to the standards of the university and all the rest. And I would have missed all that if I'd gotten what I wanted, which was to, you know, scramble back to the village. And, you know, I have to really continually learn those kind of, you said you got the go with the flow award in the Peace Corps. Uh, but, you know, continually of course, it's in my own culture, too, because Mick Jagger tells us that, right? You, right? <laughs> right? Can't always get what you want, but you find sometimes you get what you need. So that's my, uh, my second story. And again, you know, it's, my, it's getting a look at my own culture, a look at Thai culture, appreciating the flow of the moment. Um, and again, when I thought about that graduation ceremony, it made me reflect on graduation ceremonies here and what we say to people who are going to be teachers in the American system, what we try to reflect about the, the values of our culture and all the rest. Now Buddhism is, is built into the Thai structure, right? Uh, so that's obviously very different than, than our diversity of religion. Though there's diversity of religion in Thailand as well, but in Thailand at the schools, in public schools, you do Buddhist prayers in the morning and at state universities you have the monks involved and, uh, and all the rest. So those are my those are my two stories. Should we tell more stories? We ought to go to questions. We ought to see what kinds of things. <laughs> Don't you think? <coughs> Scott, you mentioned the current state of affairs uh, reference to the Iraq war. And I was curious to know when you were in Cambodia, what did ordinary Cambodians think about the United States involvement in Vietnam, and that war changed from 68 to 71. Was there a change in the public opinion there that you were aware of? You know, uh, I really didn't, uh, well, I traveled very briefly to Cambodia. Uh, this is one of those Peace Corps stories you're not supposed to tell. When, when, uh, when I was a Bangkok volunteer, I traveled to Phnom Penh and Saigon. I don't think the Peace Corps knew I did that. Uh, uh, one of the probably the few civilians to travel, but I, but my experience in Cambodia was very brief. I'm sorry, I said Cambodia. I meant Thailand. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, I was ready to give you my whole Cambodia. <laughs> 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 um, it's it's really an interesting question um, because in some ways I was very close to the Vietnam War. Right? You only have Cambodia and Laos between Thailand and, and Vietnam. In other ways, it was a world away, except for areas of the insurgency in Thailand in the far, in the far north and in, in the far south. But the insurgency never really developed in, in Thailand. When I was there, there were 50,000 American airmen in Thailand. We did a lot of our bombing of Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam from Thai bases, Tak Lee and Udon. We had a B-52 base uh, and so on. And, but the, the sense I got living there is that the, the Americans were fairly isolated on their bases, right? And, and that the, 
except for the, the base culture, there wasn't a great deal of integration of, of the American soldiers with the with Thai and, and Thailand and Thai culture. Um, and really it was sort of a, a separate world from the Vietnam War, which seems strange because we were geographically so close. But if you go back into the history of Thai-American relations, there's always been a strong relationship. In fact, when the Thai ambassador was here, he talked about the fact that during the Civil War, the Thai king offered elephants to Abraham Lincoln, supposedly. <laughs> One of those wonderful stories. I don't know whether it's true. I think it probably is. But the, the, the Thais have always, and, and with, with um, following the Geneva Accords in 54, American aid began to flow into, Viet, into Thailand. There was this, you remember the domino theory in the sense that we should buttress Thailand and, and, and so on. Uh, so Thailand during that period was, a, was an American ally. They sent some troops to Vietnam. Um, but the Thais are extraordinarily adept at, at diplomacy. And when the Americans left that part of the world in 1975, the Thais were very quick to reestablish good relations with the Chinese and with the Vietnamese, which is quite extraordinary given the rhetoric of just a few years before. The Thais always have a way of landing on their feet. I mean, during World War II, when the Japanese swept through uh, that part of the world, the Thais actually declared war against the United States. But then at the end of the war, they said, it was under coercive matters that we did that, we didn't mean it, and you know, that they were able to uh, get in our good graces and aid started in the early, in the early 50s. So the Thais have been very adept at, at, uh, at positioning themselves in a favorable way, even given the extraordinary changes. I mean, with the genocide next door in Cambodia, right? And all the things that happened in, in the states surrounding them, that the terrible military government that runs Burma, uh, the Thais have been sort of an island of relative stability. I realize they just had a military coup not long ago, but compared to their neighbors, they've been, they've been very stable. So in, in general, the attitude toward the West has been pretty favorable, reasonably favorable. Thailand's one of the few countries in the world, along with Afghanistan, that was never a colony. So they don't have that kind of colonial hangover that you would have in, in other countries in, in the region. The Thais during that period were able to play off different colonial powers. That's probably a lot more than you, than you asked for. But, um, but yeah, the Thai diplomacy is, a, is, a, is an interesting story to, uh, to watch. And now it's interesting, of course, because China is the most powerful country in the region. The Americans are less interested, uh, and Chinese diplomacy is uh, extraordinarily important in terms of commerce in Thailand. The Chinese are building roads in Cambodia. Of course, they back the Khmer Rouge. That's another part of the history of that, of that uh, part of the world. But the, the Chinese, Chinese are far more important now than they were just a few years ago. Do you have any insight into the recent coup in Thailand? Like, since you've been there so much? Yeah, uh, but I, I'll answer that, but then the next question has to go to Amy. So I don't uh, <laughs> hog the show here. Um, it's a real interesting phenomenon. Uh, Thaksin was the name of the political leader in, in, uh, in Thailand. Uh, very popular of country because he had health programs and he promoted decentralization. Very much disliked in the city among the Bangkok elites because what was seen as his corruption, a particular economic deal he made with the Singapore government and so on. And so he was also very high handed with the press at times, though Thailand has an open an open press. So you had this, when I was there in January, a year ago, he did a development tour up country, we rode a motorcycle and people loved it. I mean, he would, and basically he would listen to people's issues and then, you know, hand out funds to kind of get them, to get them started. Uh, there, so he had a populist streak that was respected in the countryside, but then a corrupt streak, if you will. And, and so when he was <laughs> At the United Nations a few months ago, the military stepped in and said we have to establish uh, a different kind of government. And now the Thais are trying to sort out how to get back to civilian rule, which is tricky because you have still strong support for Thaksin in the country. His Thai Rock Thai Party, Thais Love Thailand Party is still very popular. He has a, up in Chiang Mai, up in the north, is sort of his, his center of gravity where he has a lot of popular support. He's out of the country now. The Thais are trying to figure out, should he come back? If so, in what capacity would he be arrested? You know, all that, all that kind of business. So if there were an election, you see, I think he might have been reelected. So you have this odd kind of business, but, but not popular with the elites in Bangkok who 
felt that he had a kind of contempt for, for uh, that he was, he was centralizing power and, and corruption and so. Okay. But how about a question for Amy? I, Amy, about 10 years ago, I had a chance to spend some time in Mongolia. And it was during that period, a few years after the changeover in governance that from a communist system uh, and sudden changes. And there was really a problem in that period. You know, the, the social services were provided by the state in uh, basically people had health care, the education issues. and there were emerging then as, as they tried to follow these uh, you know, prescriptions of, of privatizing and of, of right. getting rid of all that, there were real social problems emerging mm -hmm. um, in terms of health, children's health, delinquency, uh, street children, all of these issues. And I'd be interested to know uh, where that is now, whether they've been able to get a system which is coming together to address that or whether it's the same or getting worse. When you traveled there, were you with an organization? I, I was with UNICEF in China, and we were overseeing our programs there, so we were doing assessments in the country. Okay. Well, I'll try to answer that how I can. Um, these issues are still a big issue. I mean, these are problems that are still existing. Um, Mongolia is constantly working on trying to improve education, improve teacher. Um, they've, I think within the past 10 years, they've opened up over 4,000 NGOs. Some of them are small and haven't really got their feet on the ground very well yet, but a few of them are taking off, and I think 5% are in education. That's one statistic I have for you. Um, street children are still a major problem in the capital city a lot of people have um, come in from the countryside looking for new jobs looking for new ways of life they're really intrigued by that mm, what they're seeing on television and what um, modernity means um, so yeah you have this shift of population so i mean peace corps will probably remain there for quite a while um, they re also receive a lot of outside, I mean, they still receive external funding, which, right, did change quite drastically from socialist times till now. But they receive um, external funding still at this point. I think that's what, what I can... What was your experience with Unison? You mean in, in Mongolia? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, as I said, that, that was the early stages. Um, and any time when you change a system like that, mm -hmm. then you have all kinds of problems. And that happened across all of the countries of Central Asia, mm -hmm. Eastern Europe, and some have addressed it more effectively than others. Um, I found my own feeling was that in some respects, the traditional Mongolian philosophy and approaches were, were more, the communist system somehow worked with them in, in these areas at least, because there was a uh, it was a society which by nature, such a harsh environment, had to take care of each other. Sure. And that uh, those institutional systems for that had broken down and then we were basically putting forward an ideology of privatization and now NGOs are really, it's the same thing, it's the ideology government shouldn't play a role in these things and so on. And. Uh, so I, I don't know, but uh, there were a lot of doubts about how well uh, that was going to be addressed by those kind of approaches and systems that they were bringing. Um, lots of support was coming in from outside, but of course the country had always received support because it was in essence a Soviet colony and the Soviet right. Union was, was subsidizing Mm -hmm. on a large scale, all of those services. So it's a lot of money, a lot of support coming in over the whole period of, right. of decades. Uh, and I don't know to what degree that's been replaced and how much is happening, so. Just a, just a quick commentary about Peace Corps and Peace Corps job possibilities. Amy lived in a village of, what, 800 people? Mm -hmm. You know, th this was the real Peace Corps, right? I lived in Bangkok, not exactly, I mean, I thought I would be in a, a small village in, in Thailand, and of course, 
I wound up in the economics faculty of a university in a city of eight, eight million. But that's part of the diversity of Peace Corps placement. I think they still have a huge diversity in where people end up, right? So, I mean, I learned more about volunteers from the Thai volunteers that I visited in the field with a program I came involved with through the university than, than my own experience in, uh, in Bangkok and thinking about what traditional volunteerism is about. So. This one's for Amy. Um, you went from a country that has been in existence since 1776 and in the two centuries that it's, it's been around has achieved a, has expanded into a, an empire uh, if only an influence in military power and economic power in the world. Uh, and you went to a country that in the 13th century used to have an empire that ruled much of Asia and stretched into Europe. Um, I don't know if you thought about these things at all, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the most important part of my question is, did your experience change your own identity as an American? Um, <laughs> that's a tough question. <laughs> um, let me answer the first part, because that's easier. Um, yeah. I was really excited about going to Mongolia because it is an ancient culture. Um, I studied anthropology and archaeology here at the University of Iowa and have done three to five years of field work in the United States in archaeology. While I was in Peace Corps, I had the opportunity to work with college students who were going to be doing excavations that summer um, on various different types of archaeological um, expeditions. This was through the uh, National University and then the, historic, the Institute of History in Ulaanbaatar. So both summers I worked on some archaeological excavations that were really, really interesting. Um, one was a Bronze Age settlement. Um, this is sort of, it's hard to go into, um, but if you're interested, the site was an ancient, it was some sort of, a, believed to be an ancient ritual kind of spiritual area. And what it was was essentially a large a section of land with a, basically a giant stone mound in the middle and surrounding that was a giant stone fence. And outside of the stone fences were smaller mounds and smaller circles. So the universe, actually it was the Indiana University of Pennsylvania that came over with students along with the Institute of History in Mongolia and they collaborated and because of my experience, I got permission through Peace Corps to work with these Mongolian students on excavation techniques. So what we did there is we excavated some of these smaller stone circles. And within the stone circles were burnt bones of the, the herding sort, sheep, goat, um, horse, cattle, camels. In the larger circles were actual horse heads. Sometimes they would also have the hoofs of the horses, the jaw of the horses. Um, so then we wanted to know, well, what possibly could these be about? So the professors had a couple of us conduct some ethnographic research with some local village people in this valley. Well, obviously, so much has changed since the Bronze Age. Whatever information we found out about how they work with their livestock now was going to be completely different, but it was still doing what you can with archaeology to learn about the past and to figure out what you can discover. Um, that was a really exciting time. It lasted approximately, I think, six weeks that first summer. Um, the second summer, I was working on another excavation, this was, but this was after my Peace Corps experience. So I had contacted the university, the National University of Mongolia and worked with a professor and went out with a uh, Swedish volunteer and a host of college graduate, uh, undergrad students again. And they were excavating some burials, human burials. Um, in Mongolia. And if you know anything about American archaeology, this is something that really doesn't happen so often. We have to contact the native tribes and make sure that they have some agreement with this. But this was pretty standard in archaeology in Mongolia. It's a fairly new field and it's really emerging and it's becoming, we're trying to get more, they're trying to get more students interested in it. Um, so, yeah, I had just a world open to me in terms of history and my perception of our country and its youth and um, I don't know if it changed my identity as American it just enriched it and 
made me feel more like I had a better understanding of an, the other side of the world, um, may, but not yet either. <laughs> I'm, I was reading the history of Mongolia written by Bat, or Babar is his name. He's Mongolian. He's kind of an intellectual in Mongolia. And I mean, it's, it's so, there's so many questions and so much to, to try to learn about it. I would think it would take a lifetime to understand the complexities of the ancient world. So I do, I'm very interested though. Yes. <clears throat> this question is also for Amy. Okay. Um, what sort of advice would you give somebody who's still in college looking into going into the sort of faction in the Peace Corps that's the um, teaching English as a foreign language? Like what sort of steps could somebody take in preparation of thinking of going into something like that? Okay. Um, there's a couple um, things you have to do to qualify for a position like that. Um, one is you must have an overall GPA of 2.5. Um, so keep working on your grades. That'd be one thing. <laughs> um, the second thing is you need to have an equivalent of three months of tutoring experience working 10 hours a week um, with in an organized situation. So like, for example, at Kirkwood Community College, you could work with uh, the professor there who runs the ESL program, and she has students that she could um, schedule you with and you could learn basic techniques in commerce communication um, activities or just helping them with their homework, their ESL homework and things like this. So we ask that you complete that amount of um, experience before. But if you do it in less than three months, that's fine too if you did a lot of it um, at once. And the final criteria, I can't remember, there's like one other um, little aspect to that, but those are the main things you need to do. And it just has to involve a little bit of training, um, whether that be just sitting down with the ESL instructor and having her or him show you ways of teaching. Um, but I, I had not any experience teaching prior to applying to Peace Corps. So while I applied, I did my tutoring experience. And I, I moved around at that time, so I did some in Chicago and some in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, and some in Iowa City. So I worked at different community colleges doing that. What are the two essays you need to write for the Peace Corps these days? Um, I think they're the standard. One is a motivation statement, and the other is a cross-cultural experience. I want to ask you uh, two questions. I want to know how many, like, how many African, not like, how many African Americans really apply for this? for the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm asking mm -hmm. is that most time African Americans get out of this country in the army. So these mm. people in these foreign lands only see them as killers because the United States government, when they send you into a place and you're in the military, mm -hmm. that's your purpose. Mm -hmm. And the, what gentleman over there asked you about being an American in a foreign mm -hmm. situation, that's the problem you try to keep from being an American because your Americanness distance you from the sure. people. And a lot of things that we in the West are interested in, the people in that country <laughs> are definitely not interested That's in. Very true. So we, we, we run into these, these problems. I don't have a percentage on me for what <laughs> percentage of African Americans serve in the Peace Corps. Um, we, it's, I can say for what I know about the presence in Mongolia of African Americans, um, the first female African American to serve served in 1996. Um, and I think you can actually read her about her experience online through the Peace Corps. She wrote a story and it was published in like some of these types of booklets and things. Um, she's also a good friend of a friend of mine and had a, a really warm acceptance in Mongolia. Um, Mongolia is a very warm, accepting place in general, and so she had a, a very good experience there. I also know that the first African-American male to serve in Mongolia replaced the second city that I worked in, and I think he also had a, a very good experience as far as I know. He worked in the community and youth development in a, a mid-sized town. Um, I don't know how else to answer that at this, this point without a statistic or anything. Well, I think your point's well taken. Yeah. It's, it's the kind of experience we have abroad and uh, 
and what capacity <coughs> and, and so on. I think, in, in back to the question over here in Thailand, people sort of figured out why you were there, and if you were fluent in Thai, or relatively fluent, that, that said something to them about, about why you were there and so on. Um, but you know, I often think about this uh, in terms of my experience in the Linkwa Center. In the office next to mine is a gentleman who, at the time that I was in Thailand teaching at a university, was at Khe in the Marines. I mean, his experience of Southeast Asia is just obviously radically different than, than mine, because his purpose for being there was different. It's both from the American government, obviously, but extraordinarily different, uh, different experiences. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this question is for either of you. Uh, obviously, when you return to the United States, uh, having the Peace Corps on your resume makes for an interesting talking point. Uh, is, is there anyone in particular, uh, any, any students in any particular field, who you would recommend this experience to? Which particular field of study? Yeah. Um, I think anybody, really even down to people who are studying really specific things in engineering or um, medicine. Um, I mean, even I had a pharmacy student ask me if he would have anything to do if he went to Peace Corps, and so I kind of tried to explain, well, you probably wouldn't be passing out prescriptions, <laughs> but you could do something there, I mean, if your interest was there, so, yeah. Okay, well, I'd like to thank today's speakers, and I'm sure they'll stick around for a few minutes if you mm -hmm. have questions. Thank you it's very much.